In this extra special bonus episode of Fictional Hangover, we talk about monkey butlers, fake blood recipes, a regular guy in a cool set of circumstances, prepaying for blood travel, and talking to a duck with author Jay Kristoff. <laughs> dying, literally dying. Hey everybody, welcome to Fictional Hangover, a podcast about young adult and new adult books, series, authors, and voice actors that is full of spoilers. I'm Amanda. And I'm Claire. And today we're going to talk to the one, the only, Jay Kristoff. (laughs) (sighs) (sighs) Okay. Wow. (laughs) I'm kind of shaky a little bit. I can tell. And it's not the <laughs> and it's shitting the, of pants. It might be the shitting of the pants that's happening right now. <laughs> okay. I'm, 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 very, I'm a very easy interview. You'll be totally fine. Nope. Nervous. Gonna throw up. It's fine. <laughs> it's all good. Okay. So... Oh my god, thank you for joining us. We've only wanted to talk to you for a really long time. And we finally get the chance. That's great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. Um, We talked about Empire of the Vampire back in January. And a long, long time ago on Fictional Hangover, in the time before Claire joined the show, in the BC times, as we refer to them, um, (laughs) me and my former co-host talked about Nevernight. And... I developed an unhealthy obsession with Mia Corveri, so okay. just, I'm happy that you're here. I get, I get that a lot. I'm glad you like the books. <laughs> oh, we also read Illuminae, didn't we? Yes. Yeah, we, Jackson oh, yeah, Ford. It was, it was Jackson Ford's recommendation. Yes, Jackson Ford told us to read Illuminae. Do you know Jackson Ford? You should read his books. Okay, no, I don't. What, what's, um, what's the first, the the first one is called The Girl Who Could Move Shit With Her Mind. Oh, the Behind Your Book. <laughs> <laughs> the Girl Who Could Move Shit With that's Her Mind. Um, that's a great title. Eye of the Shit Storm. That's another one. Uh-huh. Uh, what's the What's the second oh, one? Doom. I skipped the second no, one. No, it wasn't Doom. No, that's the latest one. Uh, in May, A Shitload of Crazy Powers is coming out. <laughs> Random shit flying through the air. Random shit flying through the air is the second one. So. Random shit flying through the air, and yeah. I have the shit storm, and then the third, the fourth one is coming out this year. But I can't remember what it's called because it was supposed to have something to do with doom. Right? No. And I got very excited about it, and then it changed. No, it's called a shit load of crazy powers. Can I powers. see that cover? Like, do they print the word shit on the cover, or they no? Have a it's got the, the yeah. It's got the asterisk. yeah. Right. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So you should read those. There's, yeah, okay, all right. They don't say fuck as many times as your books do, but it's close. <laughs> no, it's but it close will, they will get you hungry. They will. Oh. Every time I just need to eat pizza, cheese on toast, or cheese... What would you call your in America? Grilled cheese? Grilled cheese. Grilled, Grilled cheese. cheese. Right. Um, or pizza. Every single time. Yeah, every single time. Like it's a foodie book? Like it talks about food a lot? Or it's like well, a George R. R. Martin style? The main character, um, in addition to being able to move shit with her mind, uh, she also wants to be a chef. So okay. she makes food a lot and floats stuff around her kitchen. And All right, so it's a foodie book. See, I, I don't have food in at all. There's nothing that is more boring to me in a book than reading about people eating. Like I just... Uh- yeah, you have to have a thing for food, and if you have a thing for food, it's great. Like yeah. George R. R. Martin will write two pages about what the people at the feast are eating. I, oh, I oh, it's not, not, it's not George R. No. R. R. Martin level. No, don't worry about no, that. Sure. It's, no, sure. it's, it's more, let's go to this LA food truck, let's get tacos, and now let's go and blow shit and up. And now let's do a shit ton of meth and yeah. get crazy <laughs> power. Right. Yeah, so it's fine. It's really great. You should read so it. that's the message of the book, meth gives you powers. <laughs> But look, well, the, she the, doesn't want to do don't meth. Don't forget as well, the bad guy in one of the books was a four-year-old. Yes, an evil four-year-old. Look, you need to read them. Claire, we need to stop yeah, talking about great. them. That's not why we're yes. here today. 
It's a hashtag tenuous link. It is a tenuous link. Oh my gosh. Okay, so I think we should start out by playing Would You Rather? Yes. Sure. Yeah. Um, so we have some Empire, the questions that we ask on Empire, the Vampire episode, and then some others that are from Nevernight, and also we made them up. So, okay. I mean, we made up all of them. You get it. But anyway, combos. All right. So, Claire, what was our first question that we asked? The first about question Empire? we asked on social media was Which power would you rather have? Steel strong skin, animal control, emotional manipulation, or extreme strength? And across Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok, everybody said animal control. Really? Yes. Yes. Huh, interesting. I get, yeah, I mean, I like animals. Um, I like them a lot. Being able to talk with them sounds interesting, but I'm not entirely sure they would have much that is interesting to say at the end of the day. (laughs) My dog would be hungry, (laughs) nasty, want to go out, you know, where is my mother? Why am I talking to you? (laughs) Uh, So, yeah, yeah. I, I think I'd rather, I don't know. Emotional manipulation would probably be more easy. It would probably make your life easier than being able to talk to animals. I mean, steel, yeah. strong skin and super strength, that's kind of standard superhero power stuff. I'm sure you could save some buses full of school children occasionally. But, yeah, uh, being able to make people feel good or bad around you or whatever, I'm, I'm sure that would make your life easier than the other things. So I'm going to go with that. See, I think when I think, we went with yeah, it, we went with that's... emotional manipulation. We went down the dark side. Of course we um, did. Oh, yeah, you can go to horrible places. Yeah. <laughs> we're you, we're you'd terrible have to, people. You'd have to exercise that power wisely. It, it would be easier to take over the world. Yeah. Yes. Immediate Which villain. Which do I want to be? You could very easily become a supervillain with that power. Yeah. Immediately. You, you would have to have a strong moral core. <laughs> oh, nope. darn. Nope. Immediate villain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I get, I understand that. I understand that imperative. It's more fun that way. Who needs morals? And they're not required. They're not required at all. We had a couple people comment, and we picked the best ones to share with you because, oh my gosh, we actually had a ton of people comment. But um, my favorite I one, I think, was. Uh, I shared it at the library that I work at too, and one of my coworkers says that that they would want to talk to animals so they could have a monkey rob a bank, or <laughs> cause a cattle rush that could murder someone. I mean, that sounds like supervillain origin story as well. So if you're going to be a supervillain, you may as well do it the best you can do it. And I'm pretty sure you could be a better supervillain emotionally manipulating people <laughs> than. than having evil monkeys doing your bidding. I'm not even sure where you would get a monkey. <laughs> where would you get a monkey to rob a bag? I don't know. Who, who hasn't always wanted a monkey butler? I mean, it can't just be me who's always wanted a monkey butler that bottles. I need somebody to fetch things for me. Yeah? Cups of tea, coffee, you know. Oh, I need a snack one. Where's my slippers? I'm sure, again, that probably sounds better than it actually would be. Yeah. <laughs> like, you're I, I only thinking at the moment where the monkey walks in the door with your cup of tea you're not thinking about all the other shit that needs to happen for that monkey to literal be literal shit monkeys yeah. like to throw their feces yeah they do when they're annoyed yes they, they will do that so and i feel like <laughs> it would annoy the hell out of them if you made so the monkey cool be, if you made the monkey be your butler he would probably throw shit at you constantly oh completely yeah oh, completely. i mean just because you control him doesn't mean he likes you <laughs> Listen, I'm not into slavery. I'm not going to go down the animal control route. I'm going to manipulate you emotionally. That's right. Which is better? Well, I mean, I talk a little bit more about it in book two, but like the manipulation thing, they can't really make you feel what you don't already feel in some way. It's kind of, you know, it's a little bit, it, it's kind of dialing up or dialing down emotion. That's what the Yulon do. Oh, so they, emotional they can't make enhancement. You, yeah, they can't make you feel something that you don't already feel. They can't make you do something that part of you doesn't want to do. It's not like control. It's it's more like playing with your equalizer. So they dial up your the, anger. And the drunk down. version of you. The drunk version of you is still Finally, you, yeah. just notched up. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, that's a good way to think about it. Um... <laughs> 
Whereas, yeah, the, there is there is another vampire family that can just make you do stuff you don't want to do. They just tell you to do something and you obey. So the the the, the Elon are a lot more subtle in their in the way their vampiric powers express themselves. Yeah, yeah. I think so I'm they're kind of power the... power power behind the throne types. Yeah, rather yeah they they whisper and people listen rather than they shout at you and people obey. So yeah, they're they're kind of sneaky that way. I I don't think I would manage that very well. I think I'm more of a sledgehammer. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I would be doing some evil cackling and you know making people the do big tower. Thing. Yes, an evil tower. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Tower, tower, even towers where it's like that. Yeah. <laughs> it would need it would need to happen. Um So next question. Would you rather have the blood boiling power of Sanguimancy or the blood sword? Uh probably the sword. I mean by by insinuation the sword thing is it's like it's like a limited form of telekinesis. Like you can make, you can form blood into shapes. So the sword isn't necessarily the only thing you can do. Uh, so yeah, that would probably be more useful than just boiling someone's blood. Like boiling someone's blood, it only really has one use. You're hurting people. <laughs> Whereas, I don't know, being able to manipulate blood, you could you know, reach across the room and get something that's to get the TV remote because you could be like getting <laughs> off your butt to grab it. Um, so yeah, I think I think the blood manipulation thing would be a more more useful ability. I, I'm not, I don't know many people whose blood I would like to boil. So no, there's a couple, but not many. So you could essentially use your blood manip- manipulation to make your monkey butler. Yes, but it wouldn't a, be a, a monkey. Blood it monkey would be butler. a blood a blood monkey butler. <laughs> oh, that's just messy. That is just <laughs> extra messy. <laughs> Yeah, Imagine the yeah. stains, you'd never get them out. It probably wouldn't it's shit getting... at you, though. No, you'd want to have hardwood floors, though. If you had carpet, you'd be in big trouble. Oh, that's just cold. <laughs> hardwood floors I'm in, the, I'm in the UK, it's freezing all the time. We can't, I can't be doing with wood floors anymore. <laughs> yeah, I don't, think, I don't of... think the monkey butler is going to work out for you. <laughs> no, I'm a bit sad now, actually. I'm sorry that you're going to be mourning your monkey butler for the rest of this episode. It's one of these things. I'll give it up. <laughs> I would give it up if I had the uh, the, the option to have the like the, the sangomancy and be able to like you know blood sword things and use it. As, there's a there's a spell in D and D called Mage Hand, and you can't see the hand, but it, like you know you can use it to manipulate things and steal things and etc. And I've just got this yep. image of Mage Hand, but blood. And that's really yeah. quite cool. Hand of, hand of blood. There you go. Yeah. First level spell. And you, you, you could really freak people out by like using it and just rubbing it down the face and be like, hello. Like, <laughs> yeah. The creep yeah. factor is high with this one. And then you can do a crossover and travel to other places being oh. covered in blood. That was never nice style, sure. Yeah. 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 That's Ooh. that's probably that's probably a higher level spell than Mage Hand. You're probably talking a fifth level spell there. <laughs> it will take two spell slots. Yeah, yeah. Hashtag nerd. Right. Yes, yes. I've been a D and D fan for a very long time, so <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. I'm so happy. <laughs> Next question: Would you rather live Gabriel's teenage storyline or his mid thirty storyline? Remember, he's only thirty two, Amanda. <laughs> I know you reamed me for that one when I said he was in his mid thirties. You mocked me. Mercilessly. Yeah, he's his early thirties. Early thirties. Uh, baby. He's a baby. He is. I mean, it would have to be the young, the young Gabe storyline, right? I mean, the old Gabe storyline is, <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> no, nothing good happens to him. It's like pure torture. It starts from a place of the most traumatic event of his life and kind of gets worse from there. So yeah, I'll be the, I'll be the, the YA superhero in the dark academia setting, please. That'll, that'll work. That'll be a lot more fun. That's a good tagline. It is. It really is. It's almost like he's a professional. You, yeah. yeah, it's like I've done this before. Yeah. <laughs> Once or twice. It's like, I've, it's 
I got written in the Dark Academia book before. <laughs> <laughs> I think I would... I don't remember what I said in our episode. Do you remember what we said? Did I, pick... I think it might have been the teenage years. But then the mid-30s, that's when his sanguimancy kicks in and we're really quite attracted to that idea. Well, I mean, he had sanguimancy yeah, you... all the time. That's true. He did. And you, your wife and daughter get killed in front of you. Like, that's where it starts. Yeah, I'm not sure bad. anyone wants that to happen. Yeah, it's pretty bad. <laughs> like, that's pretty fucking bad. It's pretty bad. Um, yeah, so he's having a lot more fun as a general rule when he's a kid. I mean, that's true of everybody, right? Everyone has more fun when they're a kid than when they're a grown-up. Yeah. 22, I think, is a sweet spot because pretty much in every country is, everything is legal at that point. <laughs> And you know you're already you 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 start to actually have money at that age. Do yeah, you... and you're and you're starting to become an intellectual and adult. So you stop doing really stupid things and just do sort of stupid things. Yeah. But you stupid. know, when you drink, what level of alcohol you can have to be just happy, to be drunk, to be doing the stupid Batman shit. Do you though? <laughs> I still occasionally do this stupid bad <laughs> I still occasionally drink too much. I've been doing it for decades. <laughs> so, you know. Ah, but now you can say, I am vengeance. Mm, you can. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think oh, we need to skip really... over the Rob Pattons and Batman. Hey, it was a good Have movie. You got... I thought it was okay. Yeah, it, was it wasn't. Right. Yeah. It wasn't bad. I think it was better than the Christian Bales, personally, because they were too dark. Like, literally, the screen was too dark. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, I really liked the first two thirds of it. I thought the end fell down a little bit, but I liked Robert Pattinson. I I thought the casting in general was great. I really liked the way Gotham looked, and I liked how it felt a little bit noirish and a little bit like a detective film. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't super detective y, but at least he was kind of walking into crime scenes and looking around and noticing stuff you felt like a little bit like a detective so yeah, yeah I like that vibe I thought it was I thought it was cool I thought I he, think was... he did a good um Bruce Wayne because he was miserable as Batman but also miserable as Bruce Wayne whereas Christian Bale kind of did a was too much of an American psycho in his Batman and Bruce Wayne where he was miserable as Batman and then he was like this pretend happy as Bruce Wayne but I mean, that's I kind of what Bruce Wayne is. Like, Bruce Wayne is the mask. Like, if you get deep into the Batman mythos, Bruce Wayne is the mask that Batman pulls on to pretend he's a normal person. Like, well, he's the skin true. that Batman wears. So he, he <laughs> should kind of be... Like, if you want the identity to be secret, it probably shouldn't act exactly like your regular identity acts just without <laughs> the mask. You see, that's <laughs> where Robert Pattinson's Bruce Wayne was fine. He never went out. He was completely he didn't went out, social. right? Yeah, sure. And that is completely in. relatable as well. Yes. Like, yeah, no one, no one ever met him. It's yeah, like, exactly. okay, so there's this masked vigilante running around the city. He's obviously wealthy because he's got all these technological gadgets. Um, and there's this reclusive billionaire who lives up on a mansion in the hill and the mansion is the most goth as fuck mansion anyone has ever seen i <laughs> wonder so could they be could they be related <laughs> no not at all do you know my there's most... that scene where alfred is at the table he's like writing a letter or something and there's just a sh- shot of the dining room and it's the most goth <laughs> dining room you've ever seen <laughs> like, i'm I sure think... there are gargoyles on the wall <laughs> inside are. the house there have to be gargoyles form. I actually think when yeah. that when we saw the interior, I think it's something along the lines of "fuck off." When yeah, it was, it, was, it was like, like "oh my god, <laughs> it's so that cool," was, but yet so over I, the I, top. I reject that it's Colin Farrell as the Penguin. I can't. I can't, my brain does not recognize it. It's the best makeup I've ever seen. I would not have known it was him at all. Yeah, yeah. It, it was a weird choice. Like, I thought he was. I thought their take on the Penguin was good. But it's... I thought using Colin Farrell in that role was a weird choice because you, you, you don't even know it's him. It could be anyone under there. Um, so, yeah. I didn't but know it, until yeah, I came good. out and I and I was on IMDb looking at the trivia. Yeah, a friend of mine told me and I didn't believe it. Yeah. They did, it, they did an amazing job. You told me in the middle of a episode of Fictional Hangover and I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> There's no yeah, way. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, because then you told me about... I'm... 
kill you his name again. Joe Magnilio. No, oh, no, yeah. that was not Being a Flash word. Gordon. Yeah, I don't know how to say yeah. anything. Nobody does. No. And then we spent Anywho. an inordinate amount of time talking about Arnold Schwarzenegger being and his Japanese Mr. Freeze and his Japanese commercials. <laughs> it's my favorite thing in the entire world. <laughs> the Simpsons episode? No, or no. Or Arnold Schwarzenegger and Mr. S- Mr. Freeze? No, no. Arnold Schwarzenegger's Japanese commercials. He does like cup cup noodles and he's right. weird energy drinks and he's carrying cars. I don't know. They're the most terrible things I've ever watched, but I love them. Okay. There's like a 10 minute yeah, on thing YouTube. on YouTube and it's just right, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Japanese Be- car commercial. Right. They're <laughs> awful, but I love them. <laughs> Anyway, yikes, let's move on to the next question. My favorite one. Would you rather be tauntauned inside a dead horse or pinned under a frozen river? Dead horse. Because you die under a frozen river. <laughs> you, die, but you're, you die really quickly. But you're Gabriel. Oh, as Gabriel? Yeah. Uh, I mean, as long as there's someone there to get you out. Uh, like he's... He, he's in that particular situation, he wasn't strong enough to get himself out, so he needed a buddy there to help him. Um, but, yeah, <laughs> as long as you've got someone to get you out, then it's fine. But I did a lot of research in what, in terms of what happens to you when you get kind of submerged in freezing cold water, and it's really unpleasant, and you die really quickly. So <laughs> you need well, you a buddy. You get short-term memory loss as well. That's what I you, heard. That You can. You can. Yeah, because yeah, you're, I mean, all the blood vessels in your body just constrict, like everything just shrinks really rapidly. Um, one of the really interesting things is your lungs, depending on the temperature of the water, your lungs are literally incapable of holding the breath in them. So even if you hold your breath and then jump in, you just exhale, like you can't control it. Because oh, they squeeze. So you've got zero oxygen in your lungs. Yeah. Or your whole body contracts. Yeah. yeah. It's this kind of, yeah, it's an involuntary reaction. Um, and so you have zero breath in your lungs, so you asphyxiate really quick. Uh, and you know, there's probably a current happening, so you get dragged away from the hole. Yeah. Um, and so you look up and horrifying experience. Uh, I, I watched some videos of it had happened to, uh, yeah, it's no fun at all. Mm. So by comparison, just getting chucked inside a horse to keep warm. I mean, that's, that's kind of icky, but yeah. Falling into falling under a frozen lake sounds absolutely terrifying. It's full on. No, no, put that in the fucking book and I'm getting in that tonton. Yeah. I I read an interview with someone who actually died. Like they they were I think they were dead for something like twelve minutes. It was crazy. Um, but because they had essentially kind of snap frozen, um, they got resuscitated and they, and they didn't suffer any kind of brain damage like one of the things that will happen to people who who asphyxiate even if they get revived because their brains have been deoxygenated they sometimes suffer brain damage but this particular person even though they were dead for like i think it was 12 minutes because they had essentially frozen on the way down uh they didn't suffer any damage whatsoever yeah i went yeah i went to a very deep hole for that scene um and yeah this this it's scary it sounds horrible that is insane but now yeah, I'm very, very cool painful just thinking well. about very it. Now yeah, I kind no, it's of, no good. It's no fun. It makes me think that you could be cryogenically frozen. I mean, that's the theory, right? I'm sure if you can, Elon Musk is working on it right now. Elon <laughs> Musk and Jeff Bezos are, are yeah. working on that Ugh. particular problem. That's um, the last thing we need. <laughs> it happened I mean, to Brendan Fraser. It happened to Brendan Fraser in the 90s. I don't know if we he can count it. Oh, oh he, fell into, he fell into frozen water? No, he was in the caveman movie. He was in, he was in oh, Ceno. Oh, right. Man. Sorry. Uh, I see. I thought it actually happened to you. <laughs> should have run with it. I would have believed you. You should have just, ran, you just picked up that ball and ran. Just fucking for the next have. three minutes. <laughs> wow. It's terrible. Brent, did you do this? <laughs> that could have been the next internet rumour. Dang it. <laughs> Anywho, back to this and away from horrendous frozen rivers because that's just yeah. ghastly in every way, shape or form. 
Would you rather kill Greer Hand or Chloe? God damn you, Chloe. Uh, both of so them, disappointed in her. They're, they're both bad in their own way. Um, I'm not sure who is worse. I mean, Greyhound. We had a ten-minute just... conversation about this, debating who was worse. Oh, yeah, I'm pretty sure. We who did. won? What was what was the final decision? I think Chloe, because of being a religious zealot. Yeah, it's more dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Grey Greyhound is kind of a by any means necessary guy, whereas Chloe is literally just a fanatic, um, and they're probably more dangerous. But you can't reason with a fanatic. It's very difficult to have a discussion with a fanatic on any given topic, or whatever whatever topic it is they're fanatical about. Yeah, um, they're kind of beyond the point of reason. So yeah, in that I mean, in that sense, Chloe is probably has the potential to be more dangerous. I mean, Greyhound is certainly physically more dangerous. He's you know a, a trained warrior and a guy who's fought his whole life. But you could probably have a conversation with him easier than you could with Chloe. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Probably Chloe. Chloe is probably the more evil of the two in the in the broader sense of the word, morally speaking. Um, Greyhound does bad things, but he knows they're bad. Chloe does bad things because she thinks they're good. Uh, and, you know, in some sense, you, you could make the argument that what she was doing was right. You know, it's the trolley problem. Like, is killing one person justifiable when you're saving the lives of a bunch more people? Uh, and you know, in, on a basic level, the math of that problem is very simple. You would kill one person to save five, but if you know that one person, but someone that you care about, then it suddenly becomes a very different equation. So you could very easily make the argument that Gabe did the wrong thing at the end of the book, that Chloe was actually right, um, or at least doing what she believed was right. Whether or not the ritual would have worked or not is another question, but. You know, from her point of view, she was, you know, that, that's what makes a good villain, I think. Um, the villain needs to needs to have a sympathetic point of view. The villain needs to be the hero in the story. I'm sure if you sat down with Chloe, she would be able to explain perfectly articulately why she was doing what she did yeah. and why it was right. Um, but, yeah, religious fanaticism is seldom a good thing. It's, it's usually a pretty dangerous thing. So, yeah. Would she, she she probably wins. Would the ritual have worked? Or is that a spoiler? Uh, yeah. It's a spoiler. <laughs> yeah. So there's, a, there's a discussion there's a discussion about that in uh, in book two. because um, obviously Dior is pretty uh, bent out of shape about that idea. Like she has a little bit of survivor guilt going on and that's something that kinda of haunts her. Particularly as things get worse in the world. She wonders like you know, could all this have been avoided? But yeah, there are there are bigger forces at play, and you kind of get a glimpse of them in book two. You get a you get a a broader understanding of kind of what Dior is and what role she has to play, uh, and how she kind of ties into the history of the world and the the bigger lore at large. So yeah, it's it's not as it's not as simple as perhaps some characters believed it was. Mm. Mm. I always felt Chloe's, like, not necessarily her. Was is betrayal the right word? I don't know. I, like, it, between Graham and Chloe, Chloe's wanting to kill Dior, and you know you've gone from being one of the closest friends you've had, one of the people you've you know you've learned and developed, and he stood by your side for so long, but on a per- more personal level than what Graham was, because Graham was the mentor. And then when she's like, yeah, I'm going to kill this person and now we need to, like, you know, we're on opposing sides of, of, of an argument. I felt like her betrayal, that if that is the right word, it doesn't feel like it, was greater than Greyhand, who, you know, he, he always knew all the way along what his beliefs were and he stood by them. You know, he... he yeah. It was, it was black and white for him. Whereas Chloe, I feel like she's... You've lost a friend a really good friend and a person is supporter and you know somebody who's always been there and it felt like a bigger betrayal or a bigger loss yeah Yeah, i mean i guess i guess the difference is she she deliberately deceived everybody like yeah 
she lied to Dior, she lied to Gabe. Greyhound didn't lie to anybody. Yeah. He's you know he yeah, he, he is a far he's a far more black and white character in that sense. He never pretended to be anything else, whereas Chloe did. So yeah, I guess you're right when it, it, I mean it is a kind of betrayal. Um and that probably cuts deeper. And also, you know, Gabe never really considered Greyhand a friend. Like he was a father figure and a mentor, but they weren't buddies. Whereas he and Chloe, he would have called her a friend. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, it, that cut deeper in that sense. Also, I mean, also from Dior's point of view as well, like she's a character who has a great deal of difficulty trusting people. Uh, because of what's happened to her and her past. She doesn't make friends very easily. She doesn't let people in very easily. So for her to have let Chloe in and then literally have, you know, the woman holding a knife to her throat was uh, pretty traumatic as well. So, yeah, she she is uh, kind of going through the feels on that in at the start of book two, kind of working out how she feels about all of that and, and how that changes her as a character. Claire, didn't we have a conversation about how we thought that if Chloe would have told Dior at the very beginning what she believed, that we thought that Dior would have just gone along with it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the the honesty, because of Chloe having the trust issues from what she went through um, when she was young. I mean, when she was young, she's only 16, she's still a baby. Um, she probably would have been fine with it and actually fought Gabriel to be sacrificed for it. I think she would have been, not indoctrined, but certainly would have understood where Chloe was coming from and probably would have appreciated the honesty. You could, yeah, I don't know what she would have decided, but she certainly would have been open to that discussion. Yeah, like she's she's a pretty altruistic person at the heart of her. Um, she's a good person and wants to do good. Uh, it would be a difficult conversation if, you know, some bunch of randos show Can up and say, hey, kid, what? guess what? Uh, you're the chosen one, but we're going to have to fucking kill you. So come with us and it'll all be good. <laughs> we're just going to go to this monastery in the north and we're going to cut your throat and the world will be safe. <laughs> That's a pretty hard conversation to have, but. Uh, Do you not you think know, it's such your... a, con- a confusing conversation? It would work. <laughs> yeah, you could have you could have uh, come to terms with it. I think yeah, I think probably. she would have been okay with it if she knew from the beginning. And you know, having a brainwashing pep talk along the way, <laughs> I think she would have been yeah, okay with it. From, from I mean, but the, the the other problem is then, you know, who else in that group even knew what was the plan, like. Did Bellamy know? Like, no, he's too nice a guy. He's 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 the simple bard of the group. He wouldn't have been happy to waltz along and t- towards the sacrificial murder of a sixteen-year-old girl. No, he probably um, he wouldn't put it Saoirse, to song. Saoirse wouldn't have helped. Like, it's implied that Rafa knows because Rafa helped Chloe with the translations, but it's never it's never explicitly made clear whether he knew. Oh, where it was dead. ultimately going to end because oh. Chloe has the actual ritual, like the book where the ritual is, is in saint Yeah. So whether Rafa even knew is a question. Um, you know, well, convincing cool. a group of people, you could probably maybe convince Dior to go along with it, but finding a group of people who would be willing to facilitate that is, is pretty hard. Yeah, true. Rafa's death was so frustrating. I was so frustrated with him. I wanted to shout at him, but I couldn't because he was dead. If he just kept his focus and kept his faith. Eyes of the prize, baby. (laughs) No. Fluctuated slightly. No. Dumb shit. No. You dumb shit. No. Dead. 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 Too too much faith in things and not enough faith in in the meaning behind the faith, I guess, is the lesson there. Like putting too much power in symbols. Um, but I mean that that's a conversation that kind of gets that event kind of gets foreshadowed there's a conversation with him and Gabe um, I can't remember exactly what Gabe says he's talking about you know the wheel and how it's never going to love you back and one day you're going to find out how little it's actually worth um, yeah 
Rafa is kind of a, yeah, he's a guy who puts too much faith in the trappings of faith rather than faith itself. Yeah. You could see it happening as well, couldn't you? Just, I mean, obviously you could, you wrote it, but <laughs> <laughs> just that entire scene, it's like, well, everybody else is dead. It's down to you, dude. Are you going to do it? Are you? Are you? No. You're not really, are you? No, dead. Just waiting for it. Dead. So when Chloe uh, 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 and Avalyn went, died died i remember yeah. messaging amanda and going chloe is dead but there's no body so she's come back there's far too much of this book left for her not to come back yeah, yeah it's a lot of setup to have killed everybody at the end of act two yeah <laughs> oh it was so difficult because i had finished reading it long long before claire and i was like okay you just keep it all on the inside no spoilers right, don't right. don't react sure. Don't react Just to mysterious emo- emojis. Yes. <laughs> it's the ellipses. I see the ellipses and then I see nothing. I'm yep. gone. She's trying not to comment anything. Because <laughs> <laughs> I did, I read it and listened to it at the same time. So I, you, I used the audiobook to like read through it because the book oh, is cool. beautiful with all of the illustrations and everything. I, I, I needed to enjoy it. Um, but I also really wanted to listen to it. I thought, well, I'll right. up. I'll go old school, you know. So I started yeah, doing it cool. listen to it as I was reading it. And it helped a lot, especially with the French. Um, yeah, Damien's when, great. Yeah, it, um, it's fantastic. And it really just helped like make the, the book pop that little bit more. So I highly recommend listening and reading it at the same time. Yep, that yeah, was, he's got, that was he's got an go. incredible voice. He's he's a great audiobook narrator. I've not actually listened to the audiobook all the way through. It's fantastic. Um, oh, good. I'm glad. Fantastic. Yeah, like yeah. Damien's an amazingly talented dude, and he's read a couple of other audiobooks that I have listened to all the way through. But listening to your own audiobook is it's kind of weird. Um, it's a strange experience. Like it, it's it's a little bit self congratulatory, but also there's a there's a weirdness in the sense that you've read this thing so many times. Like by the time it gets published, I've probably read Empire, Jesus, 50 times at least. And so you have beats and inflections in your head, like, and it's just the way it is, like it's set in stone. So when you hear someone else reading it and they don't put those beats and inflections where you think they should be, yeah. there's this weird dissonance that kind of throws you out. Uh, and, you know, that's not to say that the read wasn't great. It's just different to the way you've heard it always. It would be like, you know, the way you pronounce your name. And it's always been your name ever since you've been alive and someone comes along and calls you your name but pronounces it differently. It it just feels weird. So, yeah, I, I don't that, That's an argument against audio. people listening to audiobooks. Like, the, 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 it's not read how they would want it to be read or expect it to be read so that's why some people don't listen to audiobooks it's just I, yeah I, I love audiobooks uh, i'm a huge audiobook fan because they i mean they're just a time saver you you, I, you can listen to an audiobook or you or you go to the gym or do your exercise or whatever um where sitting down and reading it, it's a it's a it's a wholly consuming activity you can't do anything else uh, and i'm pretty time for these days so audiobooks have been a lifesaver in terms of being able to keep up with my reading but yeah just mm-hmm. listening to your own audiobook is, is a, it's a little bit odd but it's a 27 hour beast and if you read it x amount of times imagine how much you've spent reading it and writing it and editing it that's just an yeah. absolute phenomenal amount of time i just wow it is it is <laughs> it's a lot it's a lot <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's good in the sense that you know the book very well. When you come back to write sequels and whatever, you know, you know, you know a turn of phrase or whatever in the passage that you need to look. So in terms of ease of reference, it, it's pretty good. You know the book back to front, but yeah, you you certainly live in its shoes for a really long time. <laughs> it's a good world to live in, though. I like. Um, I I this is one of my. I mean, it was really hard to start out reading this book. Claire and I talked about this in our episode. This was the first book that both of us had read, like, at the beginning of the year. So it kind of ruined all other books for us. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad yeah. to hear it. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. The benchmark is high. Yes. I, I like to hear it. I'm a, I'm a pretty competitive person by nature, so I'll take that as a compliment. 
I think we discussed actually when we were talking about it on the episode when oh, can we say we found our book of the year in the first Already? week? Are we allowed to say it? In that? January, that's a, that's a big call. It's a big call. <laughs> I hope it's true. It's, it's still holding strong through, you know, the middle okay. of March. So That's good. Yeah. Good to be here. Yeah. And we read a lot of books. We talk about a different one every single week, so we read a lot. Yeah, all right. Okay. All right. We'll see if we hold up to the end of the year then. Well, I mean, what I'm currently listening to is pretty good as well. Yeah, because you finally okay. started listening to his other books. <laughs> <laughs> What's what's the one you're listening to right now? I have a double speed. I listen to du- an audiobook's yeah. double speed. I'm very sorry. I have oh, yeah, three right. hours and five minutes left of Dark Dawn. Oh, right. You're reading one. <laughs> yeah, sure. All right. I'll lose to myself. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and when you're sitting in a very silent office and you're listening to it and you're going, just kill the bastard. Kill him. <laughs> <laughs> your colleagues could get a little bit worried if they were <laughs> listening to you i guess yeah thankfully it's a very very quiet office with very few people who ever bother coming in so it's not too bad yeah okay i mean that could work to your detriment it's a very very quiet office and you just hear your colleague over in the corner whispering to herself just kill the bastard kill the bastard <laughs> <laughs> that could lead to a, a call to office security quite quickly that won't be good, Claire. That'll be fine. That'll be fine. <laughs> you need to work from home until you finish the book, I think. I do. Or I need to get a duck for my desk. Somebody has a duck for, on their desk and they talk to the duck. So when they're working, they, it's one of their lecturers told them about it. So they're an analyst. So as they're right. doing the work and they need to talk out the methodology, they talk to the duck. Um, it's, it's like a plastic duck? Like a rubber yeah, duck or something? Yeah, it's just a plastic rubber duck. It's a, it's on right. Wikipedia the 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 duck the like the the duck doppelganger thing it's it's on Wikipedia and everything and I do huh. have one but he, he's at home and he's a little it's not a duck. chimpanzee it's not a duck it's a chimpanzee but it is a it is a, a a known theory that you know if you have the duck to talk to and it just helps you focus when you're having a conversation with yourself but you're trying yeah. to work out the analysis of it when you actually focus it and as if you're having a, a, co- a proper conversation with someone so it, it is a that known actually it actually makes thing. a lot of sense do yeah you, um do you have a duck are you going to get one i don't have a duck no I, I don't um but we were i was away on a writer's retreat with a couple of other writers probably two three months ago and we noticed you know, we, we would get together in the evening and kind of brainstorm ideas if we were stuck on a particular plot point or whatever. And one of the things that we noticed with all of us is even in the act of saying the problem out loud, you would solve the problem. Or if you were trying to identify what was wrong with a thing, with a scene or a character or whatever, just the act of articulating it would bring a kind of clarity. And often the other two people involved in the conversation would just kind of sit there and watch the third person solve their own problem for themselves so yeah that makes perfect sense like that's one of the things i do when i'm kind of in the closing stages of finishing a manuscript as well is i'll read the whole thing aloud to myself like say it out loud um which is (laughs) it's a weird thing to do particularly if it's like a 700 page fantasy novel or whatever it takes a long time but yeah even hearing it can bring things to your attention that you wouldn't have otherwise noticed, um, like repetitions or non sequiturs or, or breaks in flow. Like it's one thing to read, it's another thing to to verbalize. So yeah, that makes perfect sense. Get a duck. Get a duck. Get a duck. Get a duck. Everyone should have a duck. <laughs> I'm gonna get a little vampire one. <laughs> what you need to do is you need to get a monkey butler. This is no, why you need to have the, the monkey feces. butler. I don't want the feces. Talk to the monkey butler. Got, I have a monkey. Yeah. It's yeah, a there you PG go. Tips well, monkey. you know, give him a little hat and a little suit. He can't get you tea, but no can't get me tea. <laughs> he used to sit at my desk. I've had this little monkey for 15 years, and he used to sit at my old office desk, and I used to dress him up. I have an entire album of him in, in dress up. <laughs> okay. I got very bored at that place. Moving on. Yes, Shall we have another Wookiee Please, rather? yes. <laughs> I want to know. 
This is not empire related. This is never night. Would you rather travel in a pool of blood or travel through shadows but be sick afterward? Huh. It's an excellent question. Probably travel through blood over long distances because I don't like airplanes. Um, yeah, being able to teleport over vast distances is, is a pretty useful ability. I mean, being able to step through shadows is also great. I, w I wouldn't, I wouldn't complain about having either of those powers to tell you the truth, but in terms of making my day-to-day -day life easier, teleportation across vast distances is pretty good because I'm six foot seven. I don't fit in airplanes. <laughs> like airplane air, air travel is just shit for me <laughs> so yeah i'll uh, i'll take the blood pool but you can't bring anything with you yeah i know but and yeah, you have to be that is naked a good point. yeah that is a good point i don't care that's you what i'm to doing emerge too. from the blood terminator style if it's if you're traveling long distances naked just like arnie does when he do appears yeah, I, I I'd probably have to I'd probably have to go to the gym a little more frequently before I started doing that. <laughs> He's pretty buff. I'm not. I'm certainly not Arnie degree. I'm not at Arnie's level. It's more the crouch. You just master the crouch. It's fine. The crouch. So this is why I went with shadows. Yeah, right. Especially shadows have got the lol factor. You know, just little hello shenanigans. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah, you could do that. No, I'm up for the uh, sheer terror of being covered in blood. You like that. I do. You have to you have to put stickers on your cosplay dis discards to say this is not human blood. I did. I did do that. That was a good one. Being <laughs> That was a huge fucking mess, by the way. Being Mia covered in blood. It was disgusting. My oh, husband was it. just yeah. pouring fake blood over my head, and I was like, "Oh, it's so cold!" And it's just. <laughs> yeah. What did you make your fake blood out of? Um, I just I bought fake blood for oh, this okay. one. All right. Um, yeah. Whenever I use, whenever I do blood from my mouth, I make it with cocoa powder and a little bit of red food coloring, so it doesn't taste like garbage. Right. Yeah, yeah but this one was just. I like, did it. Mm. we got a fake blood recipe off the internet for one Halloween and it had um, it was like there was, there was a bunch of sugar in there I can't remember it was caster sugar or something but it was super sticky and it just stuck to everything like it stuck to me and my clothes and everything I touched and all over our apartment there was just like <laughs> blood for weeks afterwards I would find like how the fuck did that get up there yeah it just got <laughs> everywhere so I can imagine if you covered yourself in it yeah it would be even worse it was. It was terrible. I got a like a shower curtain and laid it out, and my husband was just pouring it all over the top. And then we had to, I mean, I had to walk from where we took the picture to the bathroom to get it all off, and I left footprints. Right. Yeah. It was... <sighs> it's a good thing that <laughs> no one could see him through the windows or... Yeah. Yeah. Mum didn't choose that moment to pop around for a visit and there's bloody footprints up and down her daughter's yeah, hallway. It was not good. She'll probably be used to that to be fair. Yeah, she probably is. Um <laughs> Everyone knows. Well the the, the Lion cosplay you did was amazing. That looked Thank you. sick. It was great. Yeah, no, it looked awesome. Thank you. It's so cool to see to see stuff like that. Yeah, it's the best feeling. Well good. I really enjoyed doing that one. It was a lot of fun. I took yeah, so no, many more great. pictures than that one, though. There was, like, just scrolling through my phone, just one after another, after another, after another. But that's the one. Oh, I sure. Was. I believe it. I mean, you go to all that effort, you want to document it properly. But, yeah, you look sick. You look awesome. Thank you. Mm. No, sick but... in a good way. <laughs> Do you need to have a lie down, Amanda? I might. I might, have just, <laughs> I might have just oozed into a puddle. <laughs> A big bloody puddle. A big bloody puddle with shitting and vomiting and crying. <laughs> <laughs> We've come full circle. We have come full circle. Oh my god. What other, what other questions okay. do we need to ask? Well, my question, which was the Nevernight Empire crossover, was would you rather become an assassin in the Red Church or a Silver Saint in Saint Michon? Um... 
they're both pretty bad jobs. Um, I think probably a silver saint because they're a little more altruistic. Like the red shirt is ultimately a, a pretty corrupt endeavor. Uh, it's under the control of, well, I mean, at least in Mia's time, it's under the control of Julius Scaver and the people in charge of it are, you know, I mean, they're, they're a cult of assassins to begin with. So they're not exactly scoring high on the moral scale, but they're also, you know, deceiving even the people around them. Um, and working entirely for money. Like they're, they're ostensibly a religious organization, but in fact, they're not, they're just a mercenary organization. So they're, they're a completely corrupt organization rather than the, the silver saints, I think at least for the most part, believe they're doing the right thing. They're trying to do a good thing. It's a very hard thing. It's a very dirty job. Um, and you've got a pretty short life expectancy, but ultimately you're trying to make the world a better place so yeah they're the good guys the red church are not good guys could you be trained by the red church and then go independent consultant you probably may make more money that way consultants always make more money just become a mercenary yeah but you that, they'd kill you <laughs> <laughs> just kill you not if i kill them first kill you. yeah sure i mean you could, if you if you can kill an entire cult of killers you're, you're you probably earned your independent status, <laughs> but uh, yeah, they, they just come and get you. You it's see, like the problem is we, we're women. Like we, we can't be silver saints because they're all misogynistic and like, oh no, you're a woman, you can't fight. But we have theories well, about that. You that. Can't, uh, all right, what's your theory? Well, we were talking about the bloodline the mysterious fifth bloodline that oh, Gabriel's sister accidentally also has. So clearly it comes uh -huh. from the mother. So, I mean, why can't she be doing this, these same things too? And is she? Is she is the question. Yeah. I mean, that, that's one of the interesting things about writing a first person point of view narrative. You only know what the narrator knows and Gabe only knows what he's been told. Uh, and he got raised by a group of religious fanatics who gave him one view of the world and he hasn't really been presented another one. Um, but in book two, like I say, you, you get a little bit of a broader view of the world uh, and the history of it and what role vampires have kind of played in it. So you get the impression that Gabe, yeah, he, he's only been privy to, to one, one, uh, one perception. I guess one way of seeing the world so yeah uh, everything he has been told is suspect in that sense because mm -hmm. the people who educated him have proven that they're not above lying they're not they're not above twisting the narrative or deleting omitting facts uh in order to to make the people that are working for them do and behave the way they want them to behave so sure it, it's it's definitely a theory definitely a theory so does that mean that there's going to be more badass female characters because you're very good at writing those uh there's one in particular in book two who i really like um oh there's a, there's actually a couple there's a really cool villain who's a lady who i like a lot oh my god um like female she, villain oh cool villain. i'm all i'm excited <laughs> yeah, for it she's, already <laughs> she's, she's pretty cool uh there's a there's a new uh, protagonist like one, one of the good guys who's a lady who i like a lot uh yeah there, there's quite a few there's a lot of female characters in book two actually um in terms of the new ones that get introduced a lot of the antagonists are female as well which is oh, weird I love it. but yeah um yeah I, I i hope so is the short is the short answer to that question yeah i hope so does lianthe know what their mother was going to tell Gabriel when he returned home for the celebration before about his dad yeah <laughs> I can't tell you that's all spoilery Son stuff <laughs> but we're full of spoilers here it's we true we spoilers. are and we're yeah, good at keeping I secrets I can't spoil you on a book that you haven't read yet I haven't even finished writing it yet so I'm not entirely sure how that is all going to play out yet. I'm still kind of writing the end of book two. I know the way I think it's going to play out, but until I actually write it, it's it's um, it's not set in stone yet. So that it would be 
extremely irresponsible of me to be talking about the end of a book that I haven't actually finished. <laughs> you haven't. Just know yeah, that the... we became very obsessed with the idea that the sanguomancy is down the female line and that it's the mother that is involved in that and not the father. Yes. Because at last we have a matriarchal family, not a patriarchal family. Damn the patriarchy. Yeah, it's an interesting theory. Uh, I will not confirm or deny. <laughs> I can't talk about a book that doesn't exist yet. Because things could change. Like, yeah, like I, I have an idea. I have a plan in my head. But often I find that some, well, not often, but sometimes I find I'll just think of a cooler idea as I write. Like I'm one of those authors who tends to discover a lot of the story in the actual writing of it. So my novels tend to change an incredible amount between initial planning stages and what actually ends up on page. Like in the pitch document that I gave my publishers for Empire, Gabe wasn't even a half vampire. He was just a guy. He was just a regular dude. That was a change that came in probably draft three. <laughs> like like it was probably wow. six months wow. before I finished writing the book. That was when that idea occurred to me. And I can't imagine how the book would even work now without that idea. Like particularly with the ramifications that have come through, you know, in book two in terms of history and stuff. But that was not part of the plan when I started writing it. The whole idea was he was just gonna be a guy. That's wild. He wasn't a he 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 wasn't anything special. He was just a regular guy who was in a, this extraordinary set of circumstances, which is a, it's a cool story to tell. Um, but yeah, in the end, I, I thought it would be more interesting to, to kind of give him a secret history and tie that in with the secret history of the world. So yeah, like I say, the, my books tend to change a lot as I'm writing them. Um, and I, I'm kind of constantly rewriting them as I write the book. So as you're reading them out loud to the duck, you change them. As I'm reading them out, out loud to the dark. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's hard for me to talk about book two. I don't think I he would like have survived say... the river if he no. weren't half vampire. At the very least. Well, that's the... the least of his problems of survival. <laughs> Gee, yeah, we already like, talked yeah, about the idea that. Was that he, was, he, was kinda have to, he would have to be just completely reliant upon the drug. It was, you know, it was something that he couldn't operate without. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's, it's a way better story with him being a half vampire. <laughs> like, that's ultimately why I decided to go that route. It's a far more interesting story. It makes him a more interesting character. It gives him a lot more of a interesting internal struggle. Um, and he's kind of dealing with the long-term ramifications in book two, um, of the way he has behaved over the last. 11 years you know like he's he's been feeding off his wife the whole time and now he can't so you know he's he's in he's an addict to sanctus but he's also an addict to blood and you know one of the first lessons he gets taught in the monastery is to, you know your state of being will eventually drive you mad uh and if you drink blood you will get driven mad quicker and he's been drinking it for 11 years so um, yeah, he's kind of dealing with the ramifications of that. So that make, that makes him that makes his internal struggle against who he is a lot more interesting than just you know he was just going to be a drug addict in the initial draft of the novel. So like I say, I tend to think of cooler ideas and permutations on themes as I write them. So I could very well think of a cooler idea than what I have planned for the end of book two. So I can't really talk about it. <laughs> I'd be doing you a disservice. Damn it. I'd be lying to you, maybe. Dang it. You could just make up yeah. something completely bonkers off the wall, and we'd be like, yeah, and then you laugh at us. <laughs> you could yeah, do I don't that. Do that. I don't want to lie but to you. But then it might be really good, and then you're like, ah, you're like, yeah, fuck. I, I mean, it could be good. <laughs> yeah, we could, we could crack the book right here. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I need to say how much I love Aaron and Baptiste, though. They are my yes. power oh, good. couple. Yes. I adore them. Everything about them, I just, I, oh, they're just so lovely. See, that, that was another thing that totally changed over the course of writing the book. Like, Aaron, 
Aaron was going to be just kind of a Draco Malfoy type guy. I, the the vision I had for Aaron was, yeah, he he was a Draco and he would eventually become an antagonist for Gabe. I thought maybe he would come into play kind of in book three. Um, you know, he was a guy who stayed true to the order. And so Gabe is kind of dealing with the ramifications of what he did at the end of book one. Like a lot of the Silver Order don't like him now because he murdered their abbot and committed mass murder on the grounds of their holy cathedral and stuff so i initially envisioned aaron as becoming like a principal antagonist for him and there was another character who ended up getting written entirely out of the book he was he was another um he was like a, a mentor a teacher at the at the monastery and he was the guy who was having the affair with baptiste and he was kind of like he was like the young cool teacher like all the old teachers are old and crusty and he was kind of a he was closer to gabe's age and so they kind of became big brother little brother and then he was having the affair with baptiste and he got thrown out and he ended up um you know being at abilene when gabe and dior visit later in the book but because i had to cut the book down in terms of length i had to compile those two characters into the one character which again worked out way better. Like yeah. Aaron as a character, he's one of my favorite characters in the whole book now. Um, yeah. And his relationship with Gabe is the way that changes over the course of the narrative is one of my favorite parts of the book. And I think the scene that he and Gabe have in the chapel in book six, uh, that conversation about faith, that's really a conversation about the whole book like that. If mm-hmm. there's one scene that kind of encompasses the book, that conversation is it but again i didn't plan that any of that for aaron it just kind of came out over the course of writing um that's one of the really cool things about writing the way i do that's one of the fun parts of it kind of discovering the novel as you write it it's it's probably not the most efficient way in terms of working because you have to rewrite and rewrite and rewrite but often you find um kind of nuggets of gold while you're going through that wouldn't have occurred to you if I, I'm certainly not prescient enough to be able to sit down and think of all that cool stuff before I start writing. I'm just not that talented. So I have to discover the book as I write. But yeah, Aaron, Aaron is a really good example. Really. Yeah. I mean, they do, they, they kind of come into their own and they become real inside your head. Um, <clears throat> and that's one of the, that's one of the signs that the book to me is working when characters start kind of talking of their own volition and and doing things that you don't necessarily expect them to do. That's a sign that they've they've kind of become real quote unquote in your head. They start acting in a way that you don't anticipate. Is Aaron and Baptiste going to be in the second one? In the so far? They are in the second one. Yes. Are they they staying alive? I can say that they are not having any fun right now. <laughs> Nobody has fun. No one has they're fun. Not, these they're words. not having. They're not having any fun. They've got it pretty rough. They've got it pretty rough in this book. <laughs> oh, honestly, I just, I just love the characters. I love the development of them. I love. I one of the tropes that we really like is um is like a, a friend, an enemy to friends thing, and found family, sure. especially, yeah. found, especially family. found family. Yeah, and you could. Oh, oh, as Aaron was like developing as a character, you go, God, you're an asshole. Oh, you're going to get stabbed. Get stabbed. God, you're an asshole. Go away. Oh, did you kill? No, 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 it wasn't him. And then, but you, you just kind of, uh, you're arguing with the book all the way through. But I felt like I was, because I was listening and reading, I felt like I was I was arguing with the, the audio. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a nice conversation I was having. And when it was, you saw him with Baptiste, I was like, oh. and then when they were Aveline, I was like, oh. it was just these moments of glimmers of hope and happiness that you needed and clung yeah, on sure. to. And I think that's the worry that I'm clinging on to Aaron and Baptiste so much. <laughs> Something that terrible is going to happen. Because I'm just going to say everybody dies in the end. You know, if, 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 or one, one of them, I'm going to cry. There's going to be proper fat tears i'm going to be very upset and i might have to put the book down for five minutes and have a little mourn but i'll come back to it and get on but yeah <laughs> I, I will 
It will be a strong I, worded tweet. <laughs> again, I will I will not confirm or deny. I, I I can say that they're not having any fun, but I mean, no one is having fun, and it's one of my books. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of par for the course. They had their the fun. They had like ten. Fun. Come on. They had like how long they have? Had like thirteen years of happiness. Like that's more than anyone else that's got. That's plenty. <laughs> that's got, plenty of time. They got, that's a lifetime. They got to live as a married couple for like thirteen years. They had that in gold. With the support of their community that they've built, yeah, which is even that they built. Yeah, yeah. They had it. They had it great. They had it sweet. <laughs> so they get no complaints. <laughs> It's not going to be good, Claire. You're going to be upset. I know. I know I'm going to be upset. Oh, I Yeah. I'll get over it. Yeah. Um, I don't typically tend to have many, like, sad and weepy emotions when I'm reading books. But after reading um, the, the Worst Day chapter and then going back... Yep. And reading the two words chapter, two words chapter was my favorite one in the entire book. But after going back and reading that one, then my soul was crushed. So, right. Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks for that. So you went back and reread. Yeah, that's. Yeah. I mean, that's just asking for it, really. Yeah, it was not a it was not a good idea. But that's what happens. Like you know, Claire and I take turns summarizing these books, and this one was mine. So I listened to it. While while reading the book or reading the ebook, and then I went through my actual copy and was reading that one. So yeah, yeah, right. At least two and a half times I read it between the beginning of December and when we had our episode. So yeah. just slightly obsessed. It was fine. You're you're welcome to the trauma. <laughs> <laughs> trauma is my brand, so. You know what you're getting into before you pick up one of my books. Yeah. It's not like, you know, you're you're promised a Disney princess romance and, and you got kicked oh, in the teeth. It's no, like you know I'm, you're gonna get kicked in the teeth. If it was a Disney romance, I would hate it. <laughs> right. Hate it. Same. Same. There it's needs too much happiness. It's just you too boring. need to add in yeah, at least a few buckets of blood for it to for it to agree. Yeah. Agreed. There are very few Disney films that could not be improved with a couple of buckets of blood. <laughs> Excellent. Um, okay, oh, so some other questions that we have, and we've kept you for way too long already, but I don't care because I have to ask you a couple more questions. Um, what's your favorite swear right. word and your favorite string of expletives? I don't know. I mean, my favorite swear word is probably fuck just because it's so useful mm. like it could be noun verb adjective it can serve any function whatsoever uh and it can be aggressive it can be friendly it, it's the perfect word in that sense in terms of a string of expletives i don't i don't know if i've got one um yeah I, it, it tends to change depending on the day and the mood i don't have a go-to set of insults um my, fa my favorite insult in the book is twat goblin. I've started calling people that in traffic in particular. That's excellent. <laughs> uh, just because there's something funny about the, the alliteration of that word. But <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't, I, don't really, I don't really have a fave. It, it tends to change with the day and the mood. Yeah. I remember... I think I sent a string of the swear words to you, Amanda, and going, this is just poetry. Yes. I need this on a sampler, cross stitched <laughs> yeah. onto a sampler. It's just poetry. I remember telling you like how much you're gonna love everything that Talon says, you know, until the end of the book, which I couldn't say to you because you hadn't finished <laughs> sure. it yet. But yeah. He was he had a lot of good things to say. He was he was a fun character to write, yeah. I actually wrote a lot more of him, but again, because of length it had to get cut down. So in the end he only got a couple of scenes. Uh, there's one in particular that I really liked that I had to cut um, where, yeah, he, he got very sweary, but I ended up, I ended up taking it. It was like a best of compilation in the end. <laughs> like I had to condense like three or four scenes that he was in and I just took the best insults from all of them and put them in the few that he was actually <laughs> in the book. So you, you saw him at his best <laughs> or worst as the case may be. I think we really enjoyed the repetition of just fuck my face. We did. We said fuck like, my face, I don't know how many times in that episode. 
Yeah, I'm not sure where that came from. It was good. <laughs> I, I, I don't, I don't know, I don't know why I gave my protagonist the catchphrase or why it was, <laughs> why it ended up being that. But yeah, it's, one uh, of my it's, my favorites when it's it's Gabriel and Dior and they're just looking at each other, like, fuck my face. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. I, I can I can see that scene in my head. <laughs> like I can see the 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 TV or film of that scene. So yeah, we'll see. We'll see how we go. That's where the kinship developed, where you really saw them actually, you know, not not become friends. They feel more like arguing siblings to me. Because yeah, he's only 32. Yeah, I, he's only 32. <laughs> he's only 32, yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're kind of parent-child. They're like, you know, a parent who had their, who had their kid too young. and so they're He's almost... the irresponsible uncle who babysits too much. <laughs> right, sure. Gives you your, buys you your first six pack. <laughs> <laughs> He's the one who teaches you all the swear words, gets your first six yeah. pack, gets you drunk for the first time, and takes you driving five years before you should be getting your license. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, it's bad influence. <laughs> In the best way, though. Oh, yeah. yeah, everyone oh, yeah. needs an uncle like that. Oh man. Oh, what else do we need to ask him, Claire? So we sent you so many questions. All the spoilers. Can we have spoilers? No, we can't. <laughs> um, <laughs> we've covered, like we said before, Illuminate on um, the show, and before Amanda has covered with the previous uh, host, the Nevernight series. What's the most challenging to write, though, fantasy or sci-fi? Illuminate is crazy, by the way, and I know you, you, you know, you, you do it with with Amy, so it's kind of easier, harder to, to co-author. Um, it it's just different. I wouldn't. It's easier in terms of problem solving because you've got two heads instead of one. You don't uh, have to talk cliche, to the duck. It's true. No, you have a real. No, one. you you, you can talk real, to each other. You have a real duck. That's literally what we do. We bounce ideas off each other all day. Um, but yeah, having two brains on any given problem, it's often easier to solve. Uh, in terms of what's harder to write. Um, I mean, Empire was the hardest book that I've ever written. I don't think that's by dint of it being a fantasy novel, though. I think it's just, you know, dual timelines interweaving with each other and the scope of the book kind of stretching over 15 years. Um, yeah, just it's the scope of the work that makes that made that a hard novel to write. Um, and just the size of it as well, you know, it was the biggest book that I had written too. So Empire is certainly wins the award for hardest book that I've written, but I don't think that's because it's fantasy. Um, I think they can both, they both have their own challenges and they both have their own strengths. Uh, you know, technology can be a boon in storytelling, but it can also really be a bane. Um, you know, even, even something as simple as a mobile phone has ruined most of the old tropes of kind of suspense and thrillers that we grew up with in like the eighties and the nineties, the fact that someone can just communicate with somebody else whenever they need to kind of rewrote suspense as a genre, um, took away isolation as kind of a key factor in suspense and thrillers. So yeah, sci-fi can be challenging in that sense because technology just solves a lot of problems. That's what technology is great at. But, you know, at the same time, fantasy has its own challenges as well so i i don't i honestly don't know which one is harder they're both they're both fun they're both tough uh i enjoy writing both and so i'll probably keep can continue to write both it's two of our favorite it is genres. Every, time, every, every time we get to a sci-fi book we're like oh good sci-fi yes. it's nice to go with teeth and some nice sci-fi yes. and then yeah, fantasy is particularly bloody you say oh thank goodness <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, yeah. I, I enjoy them both as well um, for different reasons, and I and I read kind of different styles of science fiction as well. A lot, a lot of science fiction, particularly in pop culture these days, it's it's more of kind of science fantasy. Like there's not a lot of there's not an awful amount of science in in something like Star Wars, for example, or Star Trek or whatever. It's a futuristic setting, but it's not exactly scientific. Like, um, so yeah. It, you can still have a lot of fun in in those genres, um, mm. and yeah, I, I 
I think I'll I think I'll always stray towards fantasy because that's kind of where I started. Um, those, those are the books that kind of brought me into reading. Um, and my favorite books are still probably fantasy books. But yeah, I've still got a soft spot for sci-fi as well. Do you have a book that changed your life or one that you always recommend when someone asks you? Um, I have a lot of them. Uh, it, de it depends on what you're after, what kind of book. Um, you know, if, if you're a writer, I'll always recommend On Writing by Stephen King. That was really eye-opening and life-changing in terms of the way I approached the craft of writing. Um, I think that's probably, I hesitate to say it's an essential read. I'm not sure anything is essential, but it was really helpful to me. I found it really insightful uh, and it definitely changed the way I approached writing as a craft. So yeah, it, it, if, in terms of writing, I thoroughly recommend Stephen King's On Writing. It's a great book. How do you feel about Stephen King's other books? Do you have a favorite? I love them. Uh, Salem's Lot is my favorite for sure. Salem's Lot was really uh, very, very good. But Dr. Sleep is my favorite. Oh, really? Okay. I've not read Dr. Sleep. Dr. Sleep was so, great. Yeah, cool. Okay. Yeah, I, I was a huge fan of Stephen King back in the day. I kind of read... I started reading him way, way too young. I think I was like 10 or 11 years old when I started reading Stephen King. Um, and Mark Petrie from Salem Slot was kind of the first time that I saw myself in a book that I was reading because he's kind of the young nerdy kid who <laughs> figures out the mystery in the town before the adults did and I was kind of a young nerdy kid who read horror comics and collected action figures and all that so he was kind of the first time I saw a character in a book and thought oh wow I could that could be me I could be I could be in this story so yeah that, that book will always stick with me. It's a great novel. I listened to the audiobook of that one a couple of years ago. It was good. Yeah, wow, okay. Yeah, it's a banger. And then watched the miniseries, <laughs> which was I, I don't think, also great. I, I haven't seen many good adaptations of Stephen <laughs> King novels. Um, I mean, Sh Shawshank Redemption and Green Mile are both great, but they're not horror pieces mm -hmm. i haven't i haven't seen many great adaptations of his horror work i guess um but there's still yeah there's been some amazing adaptations like stand by me is also oh, one of his yeah. short stories and that's one of my favorite films of all time so yeah weirdly enough he adapts really well just not horror which is what he's known for so yeah it's quite strange did you watch the new redo of the stand no i haven't is it good yeah, that's what everyone says when I <laughs> ask. So I've kind of, that's kind of, I've stayed away from it. I tried to watch Under the Dome. I think we got like three or four episodes into that and, and we kind of bounced off it. I don't, I don't know. It's so weird. Like he's such, such a famous, well read, broadly written. Like he, he covers a lot of different genres. Um, he's, he's done them all very successfully. But for some reason, he he just has bad luck when it comes to adaptations. It's not for lack of trying either. There's been a shitload of Stephen King pieces adapted, some of them multiple times, and like they just don't work. <laughs> the Salem's Lot adaptation is yeah, it's, <laughs> so bad, but yeah, I love no it. No good, no good. <laughs> the Outsider was uh, pretty good. Oh, I haven't seen that. That one was that one was okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. But see, you're still saying it's okay. You're not saying it's <laughs> There's great. a question mark at the end of that, quite clearly. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. It was good. But like Will Patton narrated the audiobook, and he just does such a good job with them. And, you know, he's an actor like himself. So he did a good job with right. the audiobook. So, but I was not disappointed with the series, with the miniseries. Right. Okay. That, that's not Do you, you have to set your expectations low? <laughs> yes, you have to expect for them to be terrible. Yeah. Uh, there's no there's no other way. Doctor Sleep was yeah. good though. The the movie was also good. And it was different, like The Shining was different. Yeah, okay. And it was it, it was good. You like know, Misery is another great adaptation that totally worked. But again, that's less of a horror yeah. novel and more of a thriller. Yeah. Um 
So it's yeah, more of a horror if you're a writer, though. Imagine that. Yeah, I, mean, it's, I don't it's, think it's, you'd appreciate that happening scary. to you. No. Nope. <laughs> no. <laughs> you did what I'm to really... Aaron? <laughs> you write to yeah. Jay. Oh. <laughs> oh yikes! Claire, now he's going to be afraid that you're going to cut his ankles. Anybody about any characters that they do because they're their no. characters, they're allowed to do it. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm not getting on a two day flight to Melbourne it's fine <laughs> I will travel through blood though oh yeah blood travel yeah. get there I'm sorry that I'm showing up naked just deal with it <laughs> it's fine you're covered in blood all your bits are kind covered of like blood. yeah it's sure. fine my hair is long enough to cover important things it's fine yeah. I mean, the, the cab ride from the airport might be uncomfortable for all concerned, but, you know, <laughs> you, you Just don't ask questions. You know, I'm going to walk with confidence through the airport. Nobody will stop me. <laughs> sure. Uh, Why am I still going you... to the airport if I'm traveling by blood? I, yeah, that, that was that was, stop I, I was that question did occur to me while I was, was <laughs> talking about the cab ride, but I thought we'd just nope. roll with it. <laughs> I thought you were going to prepay for an Uber or something as well from the airport. Just, you know, get it there, oh, ready, wherever the, prepaid. Wherever the blood pool is. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Do you accept Yikes. PayPal? Just plug <laughs> it on your phone. I, just, I can't, like, activate my fingerprint scanner because I'm covered in blood. I don't have anywhere to wipe it. Bring, wipe your hand on the cab driver. <laughs> no credit card. No. Where am I? I can't carry it with me. So... No, you'd have to prepay. Definitely. Everything would have to be prepaid. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking yikes. At least you wouldn't need a passport, though. But I'm traveling through blood. Who's going to check it? No, no, there's no, there's no check-in. There's no security. No. <laughs> Border Patrol, right, will have a massive pool of blood just to get your little buggers who like to go and travel through blood ready. They're like, ah, you need a visa. <laughs> They're going to show up there. They're just standing there waiting, like looking at their watch and tapping their toes for someone to show up. We would say the baggage carousel's over there, but you just travel by blood. Yeah, I don't have anything. I can't bring anything with me. <laughs> this has gone weird again. It has, but, you know, it wouldn't be fictional hangover if it wasn't really weird and awkward for everyone <laughs> involved. Hugely true. Yeah. So is there anything else that you are excited about or anything you can tell us? Any other secrets that you have already told to the duck that you can reveal? Um, anything? Well, we have the the next big thing on the calendar, I guess, is the Nevernight Special Editions that the Joy Crate are bringing out. Um, I think they go on sale next month. And they're kind of a, a definitive edition, I guess. Uh, the novels look beautiful i've kind of seen test printings of them now and they just look sick uh and i've kind of put a bunch of annotations in there as well just notes about the writing process or where i thought scenes were going to go and then didn't end up going kind of you know what we've talked about today uh and there's a bunch of beautiful illustrations inside it so yeah really looking forward to that did you um, add any comes... did you add any new footnotes the footnotes were my favorite Not... part <laughs> Not to the story itself, no. There's a there's like a bunch of deleted scenes in the back, um, but no. The only the only notes that I added were kind of annotations from me, okay. uh, and yeah, I would just talk about where this idea came from, or uh, what I intended for this character, but I ended up changing my mind, or what how this changed from the initial draft into the final novel, or you know. Anything and anything, anything and everything that kind of came into my head when I was rereading the novels. And that was kind of fun, like going back and rereading the books because I hadn't visited them since I finished writing Dark Dawn in like 2018. So it was fun to just kind of go back and, and wander through those books again. Did you like listen to those? With an old friend. Because no, the audio no, was it, fantastic no. with those. He seamlessly like oh, cool. added the footnotes in. So... It was just like his his voice like slightly shifted a little bit, and you know, oh, something else is happening here. And he was just reading all the yeah, footnotes, right. like cool. seamlessly integrated. It was perfect. You, you can tell yeah, those footnotes because it's so sassy. Yeah, and right. it's just like so satirical. <laughs> and it, the, it's the point when it goes, 
who writes a book and puts footnotes in? And you can, you can see the, the, the narrator looking directly at the camera and breaking <laughs> the, the fourth wall. <laughs> and I was sniggering all the way through every time uh, the footnotes come hear. in. I love it. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's uh, only annotations. Um, but yeah, so that I think that goes on sale in April. Um, so that's the next big thing. Um, we have another Empire announcement kind of coming up soon that... People have started to work out, but I can't really talk about it yet. I'll probably be able to talk about it by the time this podcast goes to air. But um, is it something to do with the uh, October release receipt I saw from a Waterstones purchase on the Twitter? Uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> and then may have gone straight to the website and couldn't find it. And gone, damn it! They've taken it down. No, they they, they took it down. To do with that, perhaps. Uh, I, I I can't say. Uh, but as, as, soon social media. Can, <laughs> as soon as we can say we will um and no one no one will miss out or anything so if, if you didn't if you weren't one of the super sleuths who discovered it I, the thing is i told my publishers like if this thing stays up online people are going to fucking find it like you don't understand and they're like no it'll be all right it'll be fine don't worry about it I'm like, okay uh, just warning you now and sure enough within like days people were i don't know how people find it but they do um but yeah if you missed out in that initial flurry then don't don't worry it, it, I, it'll... I love the sassy comments of i've got it <laughs> yeah no it, it, it'll 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 you'll you'll get your chance you'll get a chance so no fear uh but yeah we i can't really talk about that in any greater detail but other than to say it's fucking cool um and hopefully we'll be able to start talking about tour stuff soon as well there's a lot of really exciting stuff happening with tours kind of later this year uh, which will be the first time that i've got to meet readers since like the dark dawn tour in 2019 so wow. uh yeah watch watch this space uh mm -hmm. and other than that i'm i'm kind of working on book two i'm finishing book two so i'll be working through there until june uh, Bonnie started doing the illustrations and then looking amazing. Um, and yeah, I'm kind of just keeping my head down and, and grinding on book two and, until it's done. So that's, a, that's my world. Um, is there an estimated release date for that one? Um, I won't say just yet. I won't say it till it's locked, uh, okay. until the book is finished because when, there's a plan, but if I announce a date and then that doesn't happen for whatever reason, then people get annoyed. Um, yeah, we, so don't, we don't want one, to ruin one... your life. No, no, you're, it's all good. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't want to promise something and then not deliver. Um, so the plan is to have the novel finished by June, July this year. And if I hit my targets, then we'll work out dates and make announcements and, and title reveals and all that stuff. So, awesome. But it all depends on me hitting my deadline so we'll see how we go <laughs> did you ever think, think one of your books would get so many different releases like there's so many variations of empire it's unbelievable no it was it was wild i mean that that all kind of came out through the nevernight fandom really like the nevernight fandom are one of the most passionate crazy group of readers that i've ever seen and never night when never night came out it didn't come out with any kind of fanfare at all it was it was not expected to do well in terms of sales like i accidentally got cc'd on a on a email chain from one of my publishers and their sales department and kind of the the conversation had morphed over the course of the email chain and and eventually i had been cc'd on it but down the bottom of the email they were kind of talking about never night and what their sales expectations were and they were not good no one thought that book was going to do anything um so when it came out it didn't it didn't have any bells and whistles really like i think there was a really limited run of special editions through goldsboro like there was something like 150 of those red edged never nights i don't know if you've seen yeah, them they're, they're like so pretty fucking their hen's teeth like they're impossible to find 150 or 250 and that was it and and there was no bells and whistles from the states but over the course of the nevernight 
trilogy being released, it just built up this amazing community that, that was full of incredibly passionate people who would just rave about the book to anyone and everyone who would listen. And so purely on word of mouth, like no publisher money, no marketing budget, nothing. It was, it was all just groundswell and readers telling readers to read this book that it kind of built up over the course of three years. And so by the time Dark Dawn came out, the series was like, became an international bestseller, um, all because of readers. And so because Nevernight Empire is kind of a spiritual successor to Nevernight in a lot of ways, like aesthetically and thematically, they share a lot of common ground. And so my publishers figured that the Nevernight fandom would be into Empire as well. It's kind of a logical stepping stone. Uh, and based on the sales record of Nevernight, a, a lot of retailers got involved and everyone kind of wanted a piece of it. So that's where all those special editions came from. There's Waterstones and Goldsboro and Forbidden Planet and a couple of book boxes all just wanted their own, wanted their own special. Um, and weirdly enough, the Barnes and Noble one through the States came on the, I don't know, America, America as a general rule seems to be a little bit more reluctant in terms of special editions than the United Kingdom. I'm not sure why that is. The UK is a smaller market, but there seems to be a lot more kind of speculation uh, and innovation in terms of book productions. So it wasn't until I think we sold through three runs of the Waterstone special edition for Empire, like the black edged one, that one of my sales reps in the US sent me an email and like obviously they're watching from across the pond and watching this thing sell thousands of copies and sell out runs in like a matter of hours and so she sent me this email email was like hey we should have a conversation let me introduce myself uh, and that was when the Barnes and Noble special edition got negotiated so it was only after Empire proved itself in terms of appetite for it that America even got interested in doing specials so Again, it all kind of came down to the power of the readership, just this incredible group of readers that have built up around me and my work over the course of the last kind of four or five years. Um, but yeah, it was cool. Like we, we sold, we sold them all out. So that, I guess it shows that my publishers knew that what they were doing. They knew that people would be hungry for the book and they would be excited for it and, and that people would like it. And, and yeah, it was, it was cool to see the readership kind of, get mobilized and get excited about it before it even happened. That was awesome. Also, I mean, the, the covers probably have a lot to do with it. The UK cover in particular is a pretty oh, beautiful piece of art. It um, is. So that, that certainly helps. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think 95% of it is just down to this incredible readership that is built up around my work. Uh, so if you're part of that, if you're telling your friends or your family or random strangers in bookstores to read my stuff, then you're a part of that. And I, I feel an incredible amount of gratitude to everyone who helped spread the word about my stuff because I couldn't do this without you. I am that random stranger in the bookstore who will yep. talk to everybody and recommend I, books. I, so. I love it. I love hearing this. I love <laughs> I'm, hearing just, this I'm just lucky that <laughs> I get to buy the adult fiction at my library and bought copies and then as soon as they came in i'm like hey you take this just take the you need to read this book just take it just take it and that's awesome yeah. it doesn't it's like it doesn't stay it's on one the thing to have a publisher behind you and i have amazing publishers um they're incredibly supportive and i i love them dearly but it's an entirely other thing to have a readership who are so passionate and so vocal and so supportive like yeah you guys don't understand all that you do like you yeah w words can't express the difference that you all make and, and it's a it's a weird thing because you think oh i just told my friend about a book that i liked but if ten thousand people do that that's ten thousand more people who are suddenly getting told about this book so the best thing you can do for any author whose work you love is to tell your friend about it like it's a small thing but it's it's also an incredibly huge thing and important thing. So to everyone out there who's been doing that, yeah, thanks. It, it means the world. Yay. That's why we have That's... fictional hangover. Exactly. Uh -huh. That's yeah. exactly what I was going to say. It's why we're here. It's yeah. why we're here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> to fan yeah, it, mean, it means books. a lot. Like you, you, you folks don't understand how important 
what you do is it's, it's awesome it's awesome of you and what we say to authors you guys don't understand what the influence you have on us as readers and you know you're our rock stars yeah so the fact that amanda hasn't turned to absolute goo at the moment and <laughs> the fact that we're not like talking so high pitch when your dogs can hear us because we're so excited it's unbelievable i'm personally um, proud of myself i just have to say that i you should no, be making you, coherent be sentences sometimes you should be <laughs> you've stayed articulate i'm very proud uh, but yeah you're our rock stars and yeah we're just so incredibly grateful that people are willing to spend far too much time talking to us. Entirely too much time us. talking to us. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, mean, it means the world. Like what you guys do, it, it's incredible. So, yeah, from, from me and every other author out there, thank you very much. It, it's awesome. So much love. Yay, wow. It feels so special. <laughs> All right, well, um, we, will, we will let you go and enjoy the rest of your day. While Claire goes to sleep Back and to I eat too. dinner in our <laughs> yeah, all right. timelines. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. So it was yes, wonderful to talk to you. Thank you. Thank uh, you so again, much. Yeah, thank you for all you do. Uh, you will never know how much it means, but you are the best and we sincerely appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Now is the can time I ask where I one completely goo? unrelated question. I can sure. see Scythe behind you, but what's the tabletop game next to it? The one to the left. Yeah. So the one on the. Uh, I've got side. Side is, the side side is great. Uh, yeah, I've got side. The one there. to the left is that one there. That's Twilight Imperium Fourth Edition, which is <gasps> the greatest board game ever made. <laughs> that is a tiny box compared to the one that uh, my friend has. I haven't got it, but yeah, that's a tiny box compared. <laughs> they might have third edition. The third edition box is really long. Um, yeah, the they had to buy a special is, shelf for it. It's kind of deeper, yeah. Fourth yeah. edition came out probably a couple of years ago, and it is my favorite board game. Cool. Um, but I, Scythe is great. I love Scythe too. I have been nice. staring at your Daughter of Smoke and Bone because I love that oh, series. Yeah. Did you yeah. did you read Strange the Dreamer? Strange, yeah, I love Strange. Oh, He's I one of my favourite books. Yes, me too. Oh yeah. my god, I love him. Lainey, so Lainey's amazing. Lainey is my favourite fantasy author. She's, She's incredible. Amazing. She's amazing. And I was yeah. also staring, um, you have like a sword or something back there? I do have a sword. That was like a birthday present from a yeah. group of friends. I don't, know. <laughs> I don't know why they gave me a sword, but it has sat in my study ever since. Why uh, get below a sword? It was like a, it's like a Baratheon shield that I won at a card tournament I used to play. The Game of Thrones <laughs> card card game. And that oh was a prize. God. That's so, fantastic. Then we'll throw it out. Yeah, I no, love I'm, the fact I'm that you're a giant nerd. nerd. Yep. It, this I'm is a nerd. massive nerd. That's the am, best thing. I am the nerd who is to nerds what nerds are to normal people. Like I am a super if I, nerd. <laughs> if I turn my light on right now, all of that wall, and then above me is all tabletop games. Oh wow! Okay, what's your favorite? <laughs> Sorry. What's your what favorite you... tabletop game? It was a terrible question to ask her. It right. It's a terrible question. <laughs> but look, you can see my mouth on your bosom when you rolled out in your chair there. <laughs> <laughs> Ticket to Ride is old school. I get intense when I play that. Um, That's just some of it. Which one? Ticket to Ride. Oh, Ticket to Ride, sure. Yep. Arkham Horror. Particular Velsa. Oh, you're early. an Arkham Horror. Like... The the LCG? Do you play the LCG? <laughs> Dude, I've got it all over there. <laughs> oh my god, so do I. There's all my Arkham stuff right there. That's yeah, that's all my, my Arkham favorite stuff's just there. So um, good. It's so it's good. It's amazing. I kickstarted a pre neoprene mat, best thing I ever did. Uh, but I do oh, have okay. fourth edition right. Arkham Horror. Quite into out of room at the moment. Chart the Stone's particularly good if you want a legacy game. Um, oh yeah, okay. Did you play oh. uh, Gloomhaven? Um, I have. It's it's okay if you want a quick game. Yeah, not a and fan. And you like dice, die of the dead. It's fantastic. Oh, okay, that's really really good. Cool. Um, I've just taken delivery of the Marvel United X Men edition from Kickstarter. Oh yeah, I know the one. Yeah. I've got the Marvel up there, but I've got the X-Men downstairs. We haven't actually unboxed it yet. And oh, all of the... I'm 
literally looking at what I've got. <laughs> Quite into um where is it? Where is it? Oh like Raiders of the the Explorers of the the, the um of the of the North. It's kind of like um Viking set and then there's Paladins. Okay, cool. Um that's really, really good. They're my current favourites, favourite ones. Nice. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I have a few. But yeah, Arkham, <laughs> like Arkham LCG like is just amazing and I've had to, I had yeah, to take I a break while I was doing my dissertation so we need to go back and read Where it. I'm playing it with two different groups on Tabletop Simulator right now. We started playing it uh, during the pandemic because we can get together and play it in the real. Uh, and we're just finishing Innsmouth, I think, which is really hard. <laughs> Innsmouth is brutal. Yes. Um, we've got the return twos. Just oh yeah, need to be buying those. Yeah, I want, same. Want to go back through them? I need to go back to Dun- Dunwich Legacy, the train scenario. Oh, it's one the of my... best. That's what. That's In... one of my favorite episodes as well. We just did that with my uh, my second group the other week. You, yeah, you're on a train, Amanda, and you've got to get from one end, from the caboose, all the way to the engine, whilst Eldritch and Horrors are trying are to get to you. ripped off the back. Excellent. So if you don't like... move fast enough, you just get eaten. My wife got eaten. <laughs> it was hilarious. I couldn't get through a bloody door. A door wouldn't open. I kept right. rolling, and I kept getting going in the doom bag, and kept picking out the worst possible numbers because you don't yeah. roll dice amanda you 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 get it's a token bag and the token has numbers on it and it some of them are very good, cruel some of them are very very cruel some of them are auto fails and i could not get through a pig and door and it was yeah. just so funny and then i finally got through and you could imagine yourself just kind of like stumbling and going thank goodness so yeah i need to go back through because we, we were playing every thursday night me and my husband um, but then I stopped when I started my, doing my dissertation last year because right. every night was devoted to writing. Um, sure. But we need to start going through it again. But we've just spent far too much money on Etsy buying um, bits and pieces, yeah, tokens same. and stuff because oh yeah, we're all in. Yes, you, you and I, you and I have a great deal in common, Claire. Way too much money spent on Etsy on board game bling. <laughs> <laughs> have you getting the custom boxes made for you as well? No, I'm using the uh, return to boxes to keep because that kind of fits a whole arc within the box. They did those designs really well, uh, yeah. and for the ones that don't have return tos, they're just cardboard boxes upstairs. But I am looking at an incredibly blingy box on Etsy. I've kind of got it in my cart, but I haven't bought it yet. It's Honestly. amazing. It's like this multi-tiered thing with tentacles up the side. It's fucking <laughs> oh, crazy. Yeah, yeah, no. I've got so two good. wooden boxes I got from Etsy. But they're not that delicious sounding. Oh, okay. Yeah, if if you just if you go onto Etsy and look like you know, Arkham Horror LCG storage, you will see it. It's like this multi-tiered monstrosity, and the hinges are like tentacles. So when you open the box, they kind of spread open. Like it's sick. <laughs> that is amazing. That is amazing. Yeah, no. I'm I'm gonna go on Etsy now. Etsy's fantastic. The feed it's the it's a very good way to waste a lot of money <laughs> it, really is. it really is okay thank you for letting me nerd out it's been bugging me all the way through just no I've been seeing scythe and i'm like he's got scythe as well he plays <laughs> no, D&D all too <laughs> all right well thank you so much for your time this thank morning you. or this evening as the case may be um yes. and yeah thanks for all you do we really appreciate everything thank that you, you do for much. us thank you all good it was awesome to talk to you, and hopefully I'll speak to you soon. Yay, thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Oh, my God, I'm going to die. <sighs> wow, we kept him a long time. <laughs> we did. Almost two hours. Wow. Wow. Are you gonna shit and? I mean, I vomit? think that you're gonna be the one shitting and crying and vomiting. He's such a nerd. I love it. Oh, so that's it for this extra <laughs> special bonus episode of Fictional Hangover. I'm Amanda, and I'm Claire. Please go back and check out all of our other episodes of Fictional Hangover. 
And also, go buy our stuff on Redbubble. Join us on Patreon so you can watch this fantastic video. <laughs> so many things. Just join us all over the place. These extra special bonus episodes are very unique. They really are. Oh, oh, why not go and listen to the Empire of the Vampire episode as well? You probably should. You should probably do episode that. Episode 173. Yes. It, it gives you a lot of context. It really, really does. All right. And check out our social medias for Amanda's Neanthe cosplay and Mia cosplay. Yes. Slightly do it. obsessed. And also the do eyes it. gouged out from Illumine. Yes. Don't forget that those happened too. That is very true. All right. Well, let's just wrap this up with the only cure for a fictional hangover is another book. <laughs> We can turn to goo now. We can. <laughs> we are goo. We are both goo. <laughs> you can find us at fictionalhangover.com. Follow us on Instagram at fictionalhangover. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash fictionalhangover. And on Twitter at fictionalhangover, no ER. If you'd like this episode, check out our others. A rate, review and subscribe so you don't miss out. And finally, special thanks to Liz Emerson for our music. You can find her on Facebook and Patreon. Thanks for listening.